Hey guys, welcome back to the Geography Academy. Remember, this video is just a small part of a much larger course that's available below if you just follow the links and instructions. This is Unit 11, Production, Location and Change. This is divided into two main sections. One is on the agricultural system and the other is on manufacturing and they're divided into two sections, one on the theory and then one on the main case studies, although there's going to be examples throughout. So let's start off with 11.1 .1 and agricultural systems and food production overall. So we have arable farming, farming of crops and grains, fruits and vegetables, anything that's not meat basically. And we have then uh, different types there coming from different types. So we can see there some are root vegetables, grains, you have trees that then are going to produce fruits. So they require different types of growing and different care processes, inputs, processes and outputs. In a system then we have to see uh, throughout different areas like plowing for example would be considered a process in this system. So changing the land around from the stalks that are left over from the crops and turning it into soil that is ready uh, for seeds and then for the crops to grow again. So eventually turn back into this and then be plowed again ready uh, for seeding there. So plowing, harrowing, the whole idea basically especially with arable farming is to maintain the soil's fertility and in order to maintain a soil's fertility and the capacity to grow crops and other types of food you need to supply it with 18 essential elements three of those 18 are sunlight air and water sunlight and air comes free but you got to aerate and you got to ensure that the sunlight is going to match the type of crop that you're going to grow in your region so it's very climate driven we then have water so the irrigation is going to be very important in that case and that is often one of the key issues when it comes to agricultural production. Nitrogen and phosphorus then are two examples of the other elements. These are essential then for growth and it is also a part of keeping a soil very fertile. So we'll come back into those soon. The decomposers then are going to take the organic matter at the top, decompose it and let it be used then as nutrients in the soil again. At least that's the way the natural system works. In a lot of farms then the decomposers are reduced and the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus isn't cycling back in in the natural organic matter. When you think about it, a normal system operates that the plant is actually going to go back or die and leave organic things like leaf litter in the ground and then it's going to become a part of the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle going back into the soil and then back into the next plant. Decomposers help that process and if it can and uh, yeah, that's the natural one. Now if we cut this plant and we take it away from this farm, then this means, well, we've interrupted the system. So an artificial system has to supply that instead. Nitrates then allow for amino acids and protein growth. And we also see that phosphates then end up making cell DNA and help with respiration, for example, and potassium with enzymes to help respiration process too. So essential to organic matter growth. Soil also takes a very long process to actually make. We have the parent material that's broken down through weathering in stage one. This weathering breaks it down and is the home of some organic matter then. Just small life forms then may be resilient to harsh con conditions. As this organic matter dies down over time, it builds a fertile layer at the top of humus, which is also then going to have a, a decomposer or different organic life that's going to be able to live in the area and help break this down even further. So that broken down rock eventually becomes mixed with the organic soil uh, or the organic parts of the soil at the top. And this creates higher fertility in which maybe more roots can go further down, larger trees then can actually grow and supply a higher biodiversity. All of this creates a more acidic soil and the water going through can cause maybe more uh, weathering as well as it's going through. So it becomes more acidic, more fertile, and this creates then a situation where you have higher fertility and you have an increase in the potential biodiversity. So if you remove all the biodiversity, what could happen is it could actually revert or you could have topsoil erosion. So you're just left with your parent material around here. 
So that wouldn't be much good. So if you're going to remove a natural forest and area, you're going to have to keep the nutrients coming in the soil or you're going to lose the productivity of that soil. In order to do that, you can uh, spray fertilizer, for example, and the fertilizer then produces the potassium, nitrogen and phosphorus and puts it back into the soil, as we can see here, the farmer doing by spreading uh, slurry and weeding as well. So taking out the plants that aren't necessarily the ones that you want to grow. This means that other plants that are growing there won't be taking the nutrients that you need for your crops and there's less competition for sunlight water air and all the other resources as well so there's a long list of processes all the way down to pest control harvesting transport that are needed it is a huge process there seeds are very important then and seeding is very important adding fertilizer comes into it pesticides needed to be added to reduce the certain types of pests that would be attracted to eat your crop you're not the only animal that wants to eat it and then you've got water irrigation those are some of the big inputs and the big expenses when it comes to farming then we can see some leftover um, materials as well. So as part of that, then we have grains left over and seeds left over and they can be used again. We can turn the stalks that are left over into the ground and they can decompose and they can become part of the nitrogen cycle and leave nutrients in the soil as well. These stalks, for example, here for the wheat stalks are going to be baled up as hay and used as part of some fodder or feed for animals in the winter who can't graze. So this means we have recycled products back in, which are output. Uh, so we have hay, waste products, seeds are brought back into the system as inputs and then recycled while the output overall wheat then is sold for a profit. We can see other inputs here of machinery, professionals, land, seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, irrigation. So there's quite an enormous list there as well as time and effort to learn the skills and to have staff there to actually man all of these things or the professionals mentioned there. We look at then arable farming can be anything got to do with rearing off animals. In this example here, we've got pastoral farming and the output is going to be milk, beef and leather. So we're dealing with uh, cattle here and cows. We get the baby calves, grazing land for them to eat, a mature machinery then to go out and uh, maybe help the milking process, for example. Um, labor intensive then as well, housing for the animals and veterinarian uh, either on site or the, the ones they call out to the farm as well. You've then got the processes here where we have like calving, giving birth to calves, milking, slaughtering then, uh, cutting up for meat herding then bringing it around feeding rearing breeding so all of these then need to be done in order to keep this circulation going and you can get calves as a recycled product or you can get manure that can be spread around like we saw with the tractor as part of the uh, fertilizing process so this creates then a different product altogether so we can see a very different type of process professionalism needed and lots of different skills in this particular area now we also look at the inputs and think about the idea of grazing land compared to arable land as well and often they can be quite different. With subsistence farming then we're talking about just growing enough for you, your family being able to sell enough uh, to get by. It's not an extensive farm that's going to have huge amounts of profit. So a lot of people in less developed countries rely on subsistence farming and a lot of people in HICs are going back into this sort of lifestyle as well. We see that as a self-sufficiency then. Um, so a lot of these would be uh, mixed and can work in community levels as well, where neighbors would tend to help each other out, share machinery and uh, yeah, those types of things. And then you can see local sales at markets as well. So the subsistence farming then has maybe fewer, uh, more diverse, but maybe fewer levels of uh, inputs. We can see here one of them.